Well, Tangible Africa, an organization seeking to bring offline coding skills to primary and secondary schools across the continent, is in partnership with the Vela Foundation and the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University's Computer Sciences Department. This week, they managed to scoop a first runner-up spot at the African Union's Innovating Education Awards. They defeated some 900 other applicants and became one of the three organizations that were granted funding and recognition for their innovative approach to education in Africa. The organization has a footprint in South Africa, Tanzania, Zimbabwe and Zambia and plans to expand this skill transfer to other parts of the continent. Well, for more on offline coding and what this prestigious award is, uh, we're speaking to Jackson Shabalala, who is the operations manager at Lever Foundation. Jackson, thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us in our studios. Thanks for having me, Ndogoz. It's a really pleasure to be here and we're very excited to share what we're doing in the African continent with coding. Right. So the idea of offline coding, what is that about and, and how does it work exactly? Right. So traditionally, the way you get a computer or any program to operate, you code it. And coding is just a list of instructions that tell a program what to do. So, for example, you go to an ATM. As soon as you put your bank card in, it asks for something. Mm. So it asks for a pin or whatever the case may be. If it's incorrect, it declines. If it's correct, you go to the next part of the program. So now we've seen that these digital careers that exist in software development is available to people who have access to computers, online learning, etc., etc. But we were saying, what about the most disconnected communities? those learners who don't have access to computers, somewhat 16,000 schools in South Africa. How can we get them connected and learning for the digital age? So we created off, offline coding, excuse me, where we would teach them how to code by using tokens that have QR systems on them. And you don't need a computer, you don't need electricity, you don't need internet. You play with a piece of puzzles, uh, the learners love it, and then they learn how to code. So we teach coding as a way of thinking as a way of understanding systems and also as a way of having fun. Mm. So this idea of future-proofing one's career, I mean, it's a large part of the conversation around uh, 4IR. Yes. Um, your approach in, in, in making sure that even children who don't have access to computers or the Internet still have access to the theory and the knowledge, I mean, that surely guarantees their future in some way or another. Yes, yeah, so what we've seen is very important to do is actually create a pipeline, like a career pipeline for these learners to go through mm -hmm. from an early age. Because you'll find that when you get to university, of course we work with Nelson Mandela University, where the computing science department there would have someone come in and they've never touched a computer before, mm -hmm. but they're doing a computer sciences course. So they have to learn how to use a mouse, they have to learn how, what a screen is. So we're saying, hey, let's go to a school, even though they don't have computers, we'll introduce the topics, we'll introduce the theories, and then from an early age, the learner can already get themselves accustomed and navigate through what it is to be in the digital age, what it is to be uh, in the 4 IR, which is becoming the fifth IR soon, mm. so that by the time they get there, they're not foreign to it. Mm. So by the time they get there, they're like, all right, I understand the language, now show me the practicality. I get the concepts, now show me what do I have to do in practice. Right. Well, you pitched this wonderful idea to the African Union and were even able to win this prestigious award. Yes. I mean, talk to us about the reception. Uh, it's, it's quite the feat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the largest regional bodies on the African yeah. continent. And for them to recognize this sort of innovative approach to education is something that absolutely needs to be celebrated. But talk to us about the reception and what it was about your approach that singled you out from these 900 other applicants. All right, so as you know, uh, this project comes from Nelson Mandela University and is a partnership between Nelson Mandela University and Lever Foundation. Mm. Lever Foundation being the global rollout partner. Right. But it's from Kabecha, Port Elizabeth. Mm. So it's in the south of the south of Africa. Mm. And then we also know the Eastern Cape's uh, education ratings weren't really that high. So we were like, we, we're at the bottom of the bottom. Right. How can we create something innovative and as we created this thing that was innovative, we went to the top of the top, went to Tunisia. <laughs> and they were like, we have a solution, not just for South Africa, not just for Kabecha, but for the whole of Africa. And the reception was really great because the innovation behind it is what really captured the audience. Because it is a, it is a cheap process, it's a cheap project, but the content is not cheap. The content is very, very good because our, our head of project, which is Professor Jean Hreiling, is the HOD of computing science at NMU. Mm. And he's got over 30 years experience in coding and education. So we've created a really affordable project 
where we can give the best content to these learners. And when the audience and the judges heard it, they were like, this is a solution that you can plug and play anywhere. Actually, we go unplugged. So you can unplug it and play it anywhere. Right. So the, the thing that they really enjoyed about it is how affordable it is to put in any country. And we're very uh, transparent with how we share. We're always looking for collaborators. Mm. If you say, hey, you want to collaborate with us, we will give you the content, we will train your people, and you'll be able to run it the way that it just suits that context. Mm. So once they heard that and they were like, man, this thing can expand really quickly, they decided to back it and, uh, and fund it. And I think we, we're one of the most innovative uh, digital education solutions in the world, uh, I, I think. Mm. What I'm really curious about, and I'd imagine, um, you know, judges uh, at the uh, ceremony were probably also really interested in is, you know, this, this transfer of, of the skills to other areas, yes. right? Um, because what is so special about your approach is that while the input is affordable and is not that costly to anyone who wants to get involved, um, the outcome seems to be, you know, pretty much priceless yeah. um, and is sort of applicable to other areas. So just talk to us about that a little bit and, and how you see it being able to be applied in other areas, other sectors outside of just the digital space. Perfect. So what we say we actually teach is problem solving. Mm. So coding is just a way to solve problems. Uh, there's, a, there's a great quote that we get from Keith Gibson. He says, um, someone can't translate something to French from English if they can't speak English. Mm -hmm. So you can't uh, do coding if you can't solve problems. Right. Because there's a lot of issues happening and we say saying coding can solve a lot of these issues that are happening in the world. Mm. Whether you are in the software development uh, uh, industry or maybe you're in the marketing industry and you're looking for data about what do clients want, what do customers want. How do you get those data analytics to really serve the customer the best way possible? Maybe in the medical field and there's certain parts of a surgery or certain parts of something of the body you don't understand. How can you use coding and machinery that will be built of that to really improve uh, the medical field? Mm. So the things we try to teach are computational thinking concepts. Mm -hmm. So those are algorithms, understanding step-by-step -step processes of how to do things. Decomposition, uh, we do uh, abstraction and pattern recognition. Mm. So we teach learners how to think. Mm. Uh, creativity, uh, critical thinking, those four C's that we talk about, mm. collaboration. One big factor of this uh, project and this program that we have is that it should not be played in isolation. Mm -hmm. Learners should always be in a group. We prefer groups of three to five because that's the real world. In class, Absolutely. maybe you write the test by yourself, but in the real world, you work with people. I see in the studio, <laughs> you're not the only one making it happen. You know? No, not at all. So that's what we see in classrooms as well. Right. So you can translate it into how learners, we've seen anecdotal evidence of how learners have actually improved in other subjects from doing this right. uh, coding doing this project because they think it just becomes a bit more agile, a bit more diverse, out of the box, and they're even able to communicate with teachers better. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the final note on this for learners is that it's a list of instructions. So learners also learn how to handle instructions better from teachers, which improves their marks and improves their behavior in schools. I mean, it sounds like it's an all-purpose, you know, package, and, and that makes it sound so incredible. I'd imagine, though, because you're tackling a socioeconomic problem at the same time, issues around access, that there are challenges that you, you yes. come across. Talk to us about those and how you've been able to sort of overcome them and, and, and prevail with this, with this approach and, and this project. Right. Some of the challenges that we've really faced is, of course, a mindset that is, mm -hmm. especially when you get to disconnected areas or previously disadvantaged areas, like, am I good enough for this? Yeah. Like, or is this a cheap uh, product for, for someone like me, or mm. et cetera, et cetera. So we had to deal with a lot of mindsets, people thinking, oh man, this doesn't have enough tools, machinery, so it's not that fancy, it's not that big. Mm. And then once we get in and we really speak to the beneficiaries and the people see what the learners say after experiencing our project, uh, it's really helped. And Lever Foundation has experienced, we've been doing social upliftment and social development for eight years now where we've gone into communities and said, hey, we'll train you guys on vocational skills. Mm. So we've trained a lot of people on how to find a job, how to get job ready. We even have a Red Band Barista course where for uh, free we get, they go through an interview process to see if they have a love for coffee, but we train people to be baristas and then we equip them and we put them in, in jobs. So we have experience in getting into poverty-stricken areas, mm. areas where there's low hope, 
a lot of uh, unbelief in what does economy look like for us. So that's why Lever Foundation was such a great partner to roll this out because those are the communities we're going into. And we realize that we need to speak to the hearts of people before we speak to the minds of people. Mm. The people need to understand that this is, this is a way to bridge the digital divide. And once they see that, I uh, know it's been, it, it becomes easier. The challenges are getting the right team, getting the right people with the right mindsets, getting the right kind of sponsorships, getting them to see the value in it. Mm. Because this is a long-term kind of project we're doing. We're going to eight-year-olds. We're going to pre-primary schools. We're going to foundation phases, intercent phases. And we're saying, this learner, by the time they've gone through our project, which could be five years, 10 years, 15 years, they'll be able to be economically ready. Mm. So some investors see that and they're like, we're jumping right in. Some investors aren't too sure about it and they want a, a, a quicker faster yeah, turnaround. A faster turnaround. So yeah. we really try to find those people who are looking for the long-term development of a nation. Mm. Well, I mean, you, of course won this prestigious award. It also came with some funding, $30,000, yes. upwards yeah. of about 500,000 rands. Uh, what do you plan to do with that and, and how do you plan to inject it into your project and you know, tackle some of the issues that you, you've mentioned, perhaps you know, issues around resources, etc.? Perfect. So I'll just go through three of our projects that we're currently doing. Mm. The first one in our flagship project is our Rangers uh, coding game. So Rangers is our flagship project, uh, coding game that teaches learners about the impact of game poaching in Africa while learning how to code. Right. So they understand uh, what the environmental factors are. But then we also have a project that we're working with uh, Bona Ubuntu in Kabecha called Bona Africa. And they deal with uh, visually impaired and blind learners, mm -hmm. giving them extra educational material. And we were like, we can teach coding to uh, visually impaired and blind learners, which has been very tough. But uh, we have really dynamic people working around it, and it's a great uh, solution for those people. Mm. And uh, those resources will allow us to create uh, demos, to create uh, pilot projects in order to roll that out. And a big thing that we're doing as well, on the 5th of December, we'll be having a coding tournament, an international coding tournament, wow. where five of our schools in South Africa will be facing five schools in Ireland and they'll be uh, coding it out to see who's going to come on top. Who's the uh, best coder? Who's the best coder? So <laughs> I have to be politically correct and say we're going to see who, uh, who wins, yeah. but we're currently believing that South Africa, we have, to, we have to represent as a nation. So, and the last project we're doing as well is one called Mamas for Coding, mm -hmm. where we'll be empowering 100 mothers who are unemployed in the Western Cape area in Cape Town with the youth media movement uh, headed by Marshall, and that will train 100 mothers to train learners, to reach 100 learners mm -hmm. in coding. And then we're looking at uh, 10,000 learners being reached. And those mothers... So sort of the, the paid forward Exactly. Concept. And those mothers will earn an income mm. from that as well. So those are some of the projects that this uh, allows us to, to implement and expanding into Africa. We want to go into Ghana. We're going into Ghana next year, January, with 1 billion Africa. We're getting into Zimbabwe with Midlands State University. We're going into uh, Kenya and Uganda with the library networks there. And we want more partners, more collaborators. They can reach out to us if, if they really see this being a solution to uh, certain problems they face. Well, I certainly think that your solution is one that needs and is deserving of that attention. And, and hopefully we get word out. But Jackson, thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us in our studios. That is Jackson Shabalala, who is the operations manager at Lever Foundation. Up